much for um, the invitation, and thank you very much to the Champlain Mou Foundation. What a beautiful treat it is to, to sort of see the, the view from here. But I must say that now this question that you just, is the planet going to survive? I have seven minutes to try and, and answer. Um, you have also asked me to address how will we produce and consume, and how will we manage resources? And I'm not going to spend these few seven minutes to say a lot about the climate change challenge. I take it for granted that those in this room, you would know that it's there, that it's for real, that we have to tackle it. I mean, if you have not grasped the message, then we really, then the answer to your question would be no. <laughs> uh, but also we have, as was also indicated, the double challenge, not only with climate change, but with a growing po world population where whether we want it or not, we will need more production, we will need more consumption, in short, we need more growth. And if our societies go on consuming resources at the same rate as now, by 2050, we will need three times more material resources. We will need 70% more food, feed and fiber, and already by 2030, we are told that we would need around 45% more energy, 35 to 40% more water. That is what we could call the double challenge. How do we align all these needs without exceeding the planetary boundaries? How can we sort of align all these needs and still stay within the planet's ecological limits. One can easily say that this spells challenge. And I think that the cocktail that we need in order to address this will consist of at least four different groups, so to speak, where each has to deliver their part. We need science, we need business, we need politics, and we need citizens to take an individual responsibility as well. The science community will need to provide the decision makers, and for that matter also the sort of in, broad, in a broader context, the decision makers, with facts, with sound estimates, and with innovative solutions. Then it will be the business community that will have to bring these innovative solutions to scale, and it will only happen if the politics actually dare to be politicians. This might sound banal, but I'll try and argue why it's not necessarily that banal. Politi politics is there. It, the job must be to set up targets. We've done it in the climate and energy policies in Europe with targets for CO2, targets for efficiency, energy efficiency, targets for resource efficiency. Right now we are struggling to get through later this month what should be the targets for these three things for 2030. That's the kind of jobs politicians have. But also, for instance, in this commission, we have presented a resource strategy where we say that uh, by 2030, we must have doubled the European resource productivity. It really makes a difference whether politicians put up that kind of targets or not. But politicians will only do that if there is an electorate, if there is citizens out there who really sort of see and accept why their politicians should not just think for the short term, for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, but should also dare to do the right for the longer term. But one could argue that it starts with science and it ends with science. You could say at all stages in this sort of what I just described, science, business, politics, individual citizens, we, and we is, will be the, the politicians, the decision makers, the communities, we need you, the scientists. And you need to work together, maybe much more in the future than have been sort of the common standard in the past. Why is that? Because if you need to tackle global complex challenges, I'm absolutely convinced that we will only be able to do that if we pool the resources and cooperate much more than has been the tradition in 
politics, in business, but also in the science community. You could say that in climate change, the science has provided the factual platform uh, in the first place, and the scientific community deserves a lot of credit for having done so. Of course, also science has a role to play when it comes to the solutions, and maybe even more so on how to apply the solutions. There is a behavioral aspect that I would come back to in just a minute. But to take the first part first, it is absolutely key for the politicians to be able to take the right decisions and agree on the right decisions, that the scientific community continue to expand and to deepen our knowledge base, our profound understanding of the climate change issue. It's an imperative. But it's also extremely important to remember how to communicate this. You could say that is very elementary. Yeah, might be. But my experience for many years as a politician is that there is a built-in delay between what is going on in the scientific community and what the politicians have in front of them of facts when they need to take decisions. There are many good reasons for that. It's very different uh, time cycles we are working in. So I do not have time to, to dwell with this. I just think that there is something to be very much aware of, that the silos between the scientific community and the politicians should not be as tall, and we must try to reduce the potential time delay so that the politicians actually have the updated information when they are doing their politics, when they're setting up political targets. Um, I also think, from my experience before as a journalist, that there are too many researchers, too many scientists still, who communicate to their own science community rather than to the broader public. And I know all the challenges. We're dealing with complex scientific issues, and then you get two minutes or five minutes or seven minutes to explain what it's all about. But I also know from the political sphere that it is through what is in the public domain that the political priorities are being deri derived, so to speak. It means something, what kind of information is out there to the broader public, what politicians will make their broader priority. So the communication part is actually very, very important. But when then a challenge, be it on climate, be it on resource management, be it on whatever, when then that is established and presented, then of course it's about solutions. And there I would say the problem is no, not so much to finding solutions. We're pretty good at finding solutions, finding new solutions, or improving old solutions. I think, seen again from the political perspective, the biggest challenge is how to bring these solutions to scale, how to get the new technologies disseminated, how to sort of make some technological leaps in, in the bigger sense. How do we get from the laboratories, the demonstration model, uh, model to the prototype, how do we get that into the mainstream? Recently, I got a question at a public meeting. How the commission is going to regulate driverless cars? Now, there are other commission services present here, and maybe you are preparing something. I have to admit, I had not the faintest clue. And no, we are not sort of already there, because politicians do not start to regulate something which is a an idea, which is a vision, which does not have sort of a, a real sort of bulk yet. So it's about also uh, to cooperate, to make the politicians aware timely when new solutions are there, uh, so that we could diminish the time from the big, big ideas, good innovative solutions, and get them out in the broader scale. So that's one of the aspects Another, of course, is the cooperation between the science community and industry, the public-private partnership. I'm sure that you have been across this during these two days. And then it's very much about the economic structures, how to create demand for new solutions, 
how to get the markets working, how to get a price signal, how to internalize externalities, how to go beyond GDP, what is our whole notion of growth, and how to create the right incentive structure. I think that in this economic field, it's one of the areas where we really need big change in the way we are doing things. <coughs> but then I come to my last point. Because I would claim that even when the technological solutions are there, when they are feasible, and even when the economic mechanisms are in place, I will argue that that will not in itself bring us to where we need to go. I think we have a very substantial challenge in the fact that we need cross-cutting thinking, cross-cutting solutions. It's extremely difficult in politics. It's very difficult in administration. It's also difficult in business, to be frank. And I think that also in the science community, really to think across silos and, and cross-cutting is a challenge. And one of the areas where I think we see that is on the lack of focus on what we could call behave, the behavioral aspects. For politicians, I think that the complexity of the world today and the multi-layer of the challenges we are faced with, that is one of the most challenging things we have to, to address. And I know that in these, economically speaking, liberal times, there is a tendency to believe that if only the economic incentives are there, if they are right, if they, then they would make people and businesses and what have we do the right thing. I'm not so sure. Because I believe that not only problems and challenges are complex, man is also a very complex thing. So yes, we must establish the right economic incent uh, incentives for another production consum and consumption model, taxing, uh, pricing, many things that can be done there. I mentioned some of them before. Yes, there will have to be a very strong focus on recycling, on reuse, on a circular economy, new thinking there. Uh, and that can be helped through political target setting, through political regulation. It's very, very important elements. Uh, but yes, uh, we also need the technolo technological solutions, and we need to make financing available for that. I hope that the new European budget can be helpful there. But the really big paradigm shift that we need, and that we need very, very soon, that's one of our challenges, that the time factor is of essence here. To make that very big paradigm shift, I really think that it calls for being better at combining different scientific and academic disciplines. Just take one example, the natural sciences and the social sciences. Uh, you can take another example, resource efficiency and climate and all that. We have a lot of solutions. How do you combine that with ICT? We really have to think much more cross-cutting and to communicate the results of more cross-cutting and less silo thinking in the sciences, uh, sciences. Here, I think we have something that we have not put enough attention to. It's not enough just to make the economic mechanisms ideal seen from a theoretical standpoint. People would still continue to do many of the wrong things, many of the things we do not want. What is it that really can make people move their behavior, change their behavior, do things differently tomorrow than they used to do yesterday? There, we also need the input from science, particularly if we want to avoid that the only political response can be more and more and more and more regulation, because that would end up in a result that I think few of us would like to live in. Everybody knows that our present production cons uh, pattern, consumption patterns, is unsustainable. At least everybody who wants to know, know this. We also know quite a bit about why this is, but the hurdle I would argue today is to transform knowledge to action, to transformative politics. And any input that could come from science on that front 
would be extremely needed and very much welcome. Thank you very much.